Um, so you uh, have joined the free webinar at Lightspeed, the Fed watchers, who they are, what they do, why you do not want to be one. So before we get started, I have to read our um, brief but necessary disclaimer. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Nothing presented today should be construed as investment advice or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security or contract. Since we don't know everyone's investment objectives or risk tolerance, we are not endorsing any specific trading strategies. Security, derivative, and futures trading involves a substantial risk of loss and a suitable is not suitable for all investors. Each investor must consider whether this is a suitable investment since you may lose all or more than your initial investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Lightspeed is a division of Lime Brokerage LLC. Lime Brokerage LLC oh, excuse me, is not affiliated with these third-party market commentators, educators, or service providers. Data, information, and material content are for the provided for informational and educational purposes only. This content neither is nor should be construed as an offer, solicitation, or recommendation to buy, sell any securities contracts, any securities or contracts. Any investments decisions made by the user through the use of such content is solely based on the user's independent analysis to determine into consideration your financial circumstances, investment objectives, and risk tolerance. Line Brokerage LLC does not endorse, offer, or recommend any of the services or commentary to provide by any of the commentators or educators or service providers. Any information used to execute any trading strategies are solely based on the independent analysis of the user. That was long. Sorry about that. So, uh, for more information, if you want to open an account or would like a demo of the Lightspeed Trader software, please contact me. My name is Joe Ely. Uh, my email is posted there, J E L Y at limebrokerage.com. So our presenter today, uh, Bill Woods, uh, William Wood, William C. Wood is a professor of economics and uh, director of the Center for Economic Education at James Madison University. Wood is the recipient of teaching awards at the University of Virginia and at James Madison University has been chosen as one of the 300 best professors nationally by the Princeton Review. In 2002, Wood was an inaugural winner of the Southern Economic Association's Kenneth G. Elzinga Distinguished Teacher Award. In 2016, Wood received the top Gosh, I'm having a hard time today. The top research award given by the National Association of Economic Educators, the Henry H. Villard Award. He is the author of five books, more than 60 scholarly articles, and national economic education materials for school age and adult audiences. So with that all said, we are very uh, happy and proud to have uh, Bill with us today. Uh, he always provides fabulous content for our webinars. And uh, with that said, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Bill. I'm going to take down my slides, uh, make him the presenter, and we should be able to load his slides and you should be able to hear, the, hear him uh, when we bring this down. So just bear with us for one second. All right, Bill, I just made you a presenter. So uh, let's see. You're still listed as a panelist. We need to make you a presenter. There we go. All right, Bill, you should be the presenter. Uh, you should be able to now um, share your screen and we should be able to hear you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear my voice and see a title slide on the Fed Watchers? Joe, can you help me with that? Yeah, I hear you and see the slide. It looks good. Um, let's look at the questions, make sure everyone else uh, if someone could reply now, I have the questions up. I'd appreciate it. Make sure you can hear Bill and see his new slide. All right. Thank you, Richard. All right. It looks like we're good, Bill. I apologize for the, the issues today and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Quite all right. Here we go. There I am, the way I look right now. They say those little talking head things uh, take bandwidth and don't add much insight, but I wanted to be able to have a look. I am department head in economics and director of the Center for Economic Education at James Madison University. And there I have this wonderful privilege 
of sitting in on a macro seminar with PhD macro and monetary economists once a week <laughs> before COVID-19 that is. And I think that economics can give you as active investors intuitions. And I think the intuitions are probably more important than the formal models. And I love hearing macroeconomic specialists talk about macro research in terms of intuition. And it's not something you'll get from the formal presentations of macroeconomics. So today I wanna to ask these questions. Who are the Fed watchers? What do they do? And do you wanna become more of a Fed watcher? The title kind of gives away my conclusion already, but naturally, you're an active investor. I want to leave it to you. Do you want to become more of a Fed watcher after you hear what I have to say today? First of all, who they are. There is a lot riding on this being a Fed watcher because the Federal Reserve can move markets. It can move billions and trillions through markets. And if you can predict what the Fed is going to do, you may be able to buy low and sell high, what we're all sort of trying to do one way or another over some time horizon. I just wanted to show you here a general price index of 5,000 leading stocks and show you the red arrows. If you knew to get in then, that would be great. Of course, the location of the red arrows is only available in retrospect. And at the time that it's going on, one of those downturns looks pretty scary and it takes some courage to buy into a down market. But a lot of the movement you see on that graph, I believe was engineered by the Federal Reserve. And so the stakes are high when the Fed is involved. So who are they, these Fed watchers? They're folks who pay unusually close attention to the actions taken by the Federal Reserve. And I'll just mention that my presentation is based on an article that my colleague Mark Shug and I wrote on the Fed Watchers uh, for a national audience. Um, we are interested in this both as educators and economists and as investors. They watch the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, the people who actually make monetary policy. Fed Watchers are highly paid analysts former Fed staff members and former members of the Board of Governors, because of their slight additional insight to what the Fed might do, are worth a lot of money and they command high pay because of it. What they do, what do Fed watchers do? Well, they make millions in minutes for their Wall Street employers if they can correctly predict the next move. If you can correctly predict which way markets are going to move, even a little bit, if you've got some capital to employ, there's a lot of money in it. Now, why it works inside the economics of all this, in monetary economics, we refer to the transmission mechanism. And you know, you think about a transmission mechanism, and no, it's not a car part. <laughs> but it is a pretty good analogy here because when you step on the gas and your engine goes faster, your wheels aren't going to turn any faster until that power gets through the transmission. In a similar way, the Federal Reserve can step on the monetary gas pedal, but it's not going to go through to the real economy unless it goes through a transmission mechanism that somehow causes real variables to respond to the Fed. It's not a car part. Instead, it's how the Fed's changes flow through to the real economy and asset markets. Monetary economists have been studying the transmission a long time. We partially understand it. And now the Fed is changing <laughs> a lot of what we knew about the transmission mechanism. So let's have a look here. There is a key trade-off that goes all the way back to John Maynard Keynes. You face a lot of trade-offs in deciding on your portfolio, but Keynes focused on money versus bonds. Some people think Keynes was right about a lot of things. Some people think Keynes was wrong about a lot of things. But this key trade-off on money versus bonds, his insights hold up pretty well after all these years. Think about money on the sidelines. 
just in a cash equivalent, like a money market fund, that cash is going to be much greater when interest rates are low when we are considering the trade off of money versus bonds. Part of your portfolio decision, but not all. How much of that that you're going to keep in money, cash equivalents, and bonds, how much of it do you want in those cash equivalents, and how much of it do you want in bonds? Well, when uh, interest rates are persistently low, let's draw the diagram here. We'll put the interest rate vertically and the amount of money in cash equivalents horizontally. And I'll put the green dot right there just to indicate that when interest rates are very low and new money going into bonds isn't going to earn very much interest, then yeah, you know, we'll kind of keep our money on the sidelines. But what if interest rates are really high? Then you wanna shift short-term money into bonds to get that return. Uh, this is new money that's going into the bonds and many of you obviously will understand that distinction. And you don't keep much on the sidelines at a time like that. So when we're drawing that same diagram with the interest rate vertically and the amount of money horizontally then we're at a green dot like that. And that is the time when we wanna clear out our money when we're looking at the trade-off between money and bonds, and we wanna go get it in the place where it earns that really high interest rate. And so monetary economists for many years were accustomed to draw a demand for money curve. It would be just like the demand for oranges. It was formerly thought of as a well-defined and measured function. And if we were just drawing the demand for oranges, why, we'd show that at a high price of oranges, people don't wanna buy very many oranges, at a low price they do. This is Econ 101. It gets more complicated when we're talking about money and other assets. Today, we think the demand for money is fuzzier. We don't think that it is nearly as predictable and manageable as we once did. And so when we draw that demand for money, we're drawing it on that same set of axes, the interest rate and the amount of money. And this is the way we used to think of it. Hey, there it was a line. It might curve one way, it might curve another, but we were just pretty sure that depending on the amount of money, we would be somewhere on that curve. And we thought that the Federal Reserve could easily move us up and down that curve by changing the amount of money in the economy. Now it's fuzzier. We sometimes see ourselves off the line up there in a direction like that. We sometimes see ourselves off the line on the inside in a direction like that. The line that we thought the economy would always be on, that demand for money, eh, not so much. Sometimes we hit it pretty closely and other times we're a long way away from the line, like that. I wanna tell you a story that to me really illustrates this, and I will tell you, this is a true story. The guy's name was Bill B. He was an international economic consultant who had the office right next to me, and he received a check with too many zeros from a consulting job. That's never happened to me. <laughs> you know, has it ever happened to you? But I think it was like a um, $10,000 check he was supposed to get that came to 100,000 or more. Wow, how about that? So what he did was he put it in a money market fund and left the country because he was an international economic consultant. And he went to the country that was then called Kampuchea and you'd recognize it more familiarly as uh, Cambodia. And he was totally incommunicado because in that day, there just wasn't very good communication. Well, the sponsor of this grant quickly discovered the mistake and started frantically asking for the money back. And so after receiving notice, when he returned to this country, he promised, okay, I will look into it. He wrote that in a letter, mailed it, and left the country again. <laughs> So weeks are going by. He's in another developing country doing his international economic consulting and he hasn't given them their money back. 
he stalled some weeks before repaying in full. This happened in the year 1980 when the annual return on money market funds was 12.68% on average. Now, we could argue about the ethics of what he did. I don't know that it was totally ethical to do that. I suppose in his defense, he would say, well, you know, he told them he would look into it. And when he found out that it was true and got back into the country, he paid it back. So they didn't lose anything, but you know, in economics, we think about the opportunity cost of funds. And in 1980, that was a very high opportunity cost. So that, that is Bill B's story. He was a guy who lived life to the fullest. Uh, he passed away um, sometime after that. Amazing fellow. And when they were trying to settle the estate, they found that airports all over the developing world were finding his Mercedes. He always liked to drive a Mercedes when he was in developing country. So he would just leave it at the airport and come bail it out when he got there. And it actually took him some time to find and track down all of those Mercedes automobiles. Should you become more of a Fed watcher? That, I think, is the essence of the question that I want to ask and explore with you today. Keeping in mind that we're all amateur Fed watchers, we all have to keep an eye on the Fed if we really want to understand what's going on in the economy. So let's consider that question. The Federal Open Market Committee is where the action is. It meets eight times a year to set interest rates. There's a picture of their conference room. There's a lot of disagreement in the economics community about just how to model their behavior. The post-meeting reports typically state that the Fed lowered interest rates or raised interest rates or kept rates unchanged. That's what you'll hear, right? You're familiar with those things that you'll hear from news broadcasts and websites and places like that. Uh, but the Fed operates in a market economy and it can't, cannot here actually command all interest rates to rise or fall. And so the Fed's influence through this transmission mechanism that we're talking about is a matter of some complexity. What can it do? And let me just say, this is changing every day. I will intermix for your intuition the traditional views and the views that have come up in just the fast past two or three weeks uh, as we go through this. What can it do? I want to peel the onion here, and there's an onion being peeled. And I want to do this because this is something I discovered about the Fed. No matter how accurate and detailed a description of the Federal Open Market Committee, there's always another layer of detail. The layer of detail that we teach in Econ 1 is on the outside of the onion. When you go talk to people at the Fed, they'll talk to you about another layer deeper, but there's always another layer of detail. Um, they will say, oh, you know, the Fed really doesn't buy bonds. It's more done through repurchase agreements. And they'll say, oh, you know, there's really this agreement with the New York bond dealers. And no matter how deeply you get into this, there's always another layer of detail. And I have become convinced that there are probably only five people in the world that really know how the Fed does it there at the center of the onion. However, Fed staffers and monetary economists have told me that the story you're about to hear is accurate given the level of detail, but not fully accurately descriptive, but accurate given the level of detail, and there is always more to learn. So here's the story. When there is loose money, you see the party favors there. When the Federal Open Market Committee decides to ease, it puts liquidity into the system. And we all know that purchases of government securities inject money into the system. How? By taking in securities that are not money and pushing out reserves to the banking system. I've got, um, we can say directly here that the Fed just says the interest rate we control is getting lower and then it backs it up with action, putting enough liquidity into those markets to make sure that those interest rates are sustainable. Tight money, frowny face, just the opposite here. When the Federal Open Market Committee decides to tighten, it pulls liquidity out. 
and sales of government securities pull money out of the system. And how is that so? By pulling in reserves from the banking system and pushing out government securities. Or the Federal Reserve can just directly say, the interest rate we control is getting higher and then back it up with action, pulling out those uh, reserves from the banking system so that that interest rate will be sustainable. So we have loose money and we have tight money, but there is a real question, somewhat fluid, what can the Fed do? And the answer to that question is almost anything. In that last crisis that we had, the Fed invoked this special provision of the Federal Reserve Act, it's section 13.3. You may have heard about section 13.3 just in the last two or three weeks. It gives the Fed the authority to lend to any individual partnership or corporation. Stop and think how broad that is. Do you see what the Fed can do? In unusual and exigent circumstances. That's in the Federal Reserve Act. And guess who gets to decide what unusual and exigent circumstances are? You got it, the Fed. It's not a decision, a decision that is anyway significantly reviewable by Congress or the president. The Congress can't command monetary policy and the president has very limited authority. The president can appoint Fed uh, board members and can appoint the chair, but it's been pretty well determined that the Fed can't be controlled by a president over differences in monetary policy. I found out about section 13.3 when I was writing this article, it's not your mother and father's monetary policy anymore, the Federal Reserve and financial crisis relief. And that article is still posted out there on the Philly Fed's uh, website. So you can go have a look and, uh, and see that indeed the Fed can do almost anything. Uh, wow, how about that? The exchange story. This is a story and my monetary expert says, it's a good story, and it's also accurate taken as a story. And it is a story that I've used with people trying to understand monetary policy and the role, the relationship to their investments, I think with some success. And this story says that the Federal Reserve has the magic checkbook. Ah. Does the Federal Reserve really have the magic checkbook and why is it magic? Well, yeah, the Federal Reserve does have the magic checkbook and it's magic because it is a checkbook on which the Fed can write checks without having any money in the account because the Fed simply creates the money to make the money in the magic checkbook good. Now, my monetary expert says it's accurate taken as a story. And if you know the way the Fed operates, you already see some weaknesses in the story. It doesn't actually write checks. It does all this electronically. It's mouse clicks, not paper. But the magic checkbook, I think, is a useful metaphor for understanding how it happens. And what does it do traditionally with the magic checkbook? It buys US government securities bonds and other things that are held by the public. And you notice that when the Fed uses the checkbook, the magic checkbook, it pushes money out into the economy and the Fed takes the bond in. One important thing to know is that money that is sequestered inside the Fed isn't money at all. There is an installation up in the side of a mountain close to Culpeper, Virginia, where the rumor always said, that's where the extra currency was stored in the event of nuclear war. I never knew if it was true, <laughs> but in commuting back and forth, I did notice my radio reception on my car radio got very bad at the time. Well, if it is true, and I'm sure that money is somewhere, <laughs> then that money is not part of the money supply. It has no effect on the economy. In a similar fashion, money that is held within the Federal Reserve isn't really money because it's not part of the money supply. So let's just back that up and look at the magic checkbook and look at this exchange. When the Fed uses the magic checkbook or its electronic equivalent 
to push money out into the economy, the money leaves the Fed and the bond, which is not money, comes into the Fed. So the Fed has just pushed something out into the economy that is money and generates money and it has taken in something that's not money. This brings us to the story of Ben Bernanke's couch. Ben Bernanke, the former head of the Federal Reserve. This is one of those intuitive stories that I love to hear macroeconomists tell that has an amazing amount of insight for today's Federal Reserve. It's about the former Fed chair, Ben Bernanke, and it says, he comes over for lunch. By the way, I got this story from a study guide by Greg Mankiw, uh, Harvard University macro guy, who wrote the textbook, my favorite textbook that I always use when I'm teaching macroeconomics. Uh, ben loves your couch, and he buys it with a check drawn on the Federal Reserve. Hey, you know, I'd love to have that couch for my office back at the Fed. Were you willing to sell it? Well, sure. Does that increase the money supply? Yes, it does. It increases the money supply because when the magic checkbook is used, it takes money that was there at the Fed and therefore not part of the money supply and pushes it out into the economy. Now, we're not going to worry about the effect on the sofa market if Ben Bernanke goes out and buys somebody's couch. If today Jerome Powell goes out and buys somebody's couch, if in between Janet Yellen went out and bought somebody's couch. The story is obviously fanciful. But what if the Federal Reserve went out and bought 10,000 couches or 100,000 couches? Well, then we might have reason to worry about the Fed distorting a market, making couch prices too high, sofa prices higher than they would otherwise be. With its Section 13.3 authority, the Fed can buy anything. And I'm putting the anything in quotation marks, but we have just learned in the last couple of weeks, the range of what the Fed can buy with its 13.3 authority really is wide. So the Federal Reserve can influence the market for just about anything. This is our magic checkbook picture again, but this time instead of a bond, it's buying Ben Bernanke's uh, new couch for the Federal Reserve. Examples of Fed influence. Do you see how far reaching this can be? The Fed can buy longer treasury securities. The Fed traditionally was only in the market for relatively short term securities, but with Section 13.3 authority and operating its own initiative, certainly the Fed can buy longer treasury securities, can and has. The Fed can buy housing related securities, can and has. The Federal Reserve can help money market funds avoid breaking the buck. You've probably heard that term. Most of us tend to think of money market funds as just super checking accounts. We can treat them just like a checking account. Well, no, you can't. <laughs> can't just treat it like a checking account because real checking accounts at banks are FDIC insured, Nobody's ever lost a penny of insured deposits, uh, that would be individuals, since the origin of federal deposit insurance. Whereas money market funds, their ability to act just like a super checking account that pays a little higher interest is dependent on their ability to trade favorably in the markets for very short term securities. In a time of crisis, it is possible that a money market fund would have to say to you, hey, you know that $10,000 that you've got there? Uh, it's not $10,000 anymore. We're going to have to break the buck. Uh, the value of our money market fund is actually going to be a little less than a dollar. I was actually sitting on tuition and fee money for my younger son for a year in college in my money market fund at the time of the last crisis. I was one mouse click away from moving that money to my bank, where it would be FDIC insured. And as I was sitting there thinking about clicking that mouse, the news came in that the Federal Reserve had announced a new facility to keep the money market funds 
from breaking the buck. There was one fund in particular, but it, the way Fed operates, it sort of became a precedent. And as a result, the traditional admonition that says, hey, that money market fund isn't as safe as an FDIC insured deposit, well, that traditional admonition is still true, but people who want to take a little risk, the Federal Reserve just indicated that risk was less than you thought. Because if a money market fund comes close to breaking the buck, the Fed may step in. The market for high yielding bonds. The Federal Reserve traditionally was not involved in the market for high yielding or junk bonds, but under Section 13.3, it can be. And in the recent crisis, when the Federal Reserve just announced that it was going to buy some of those bonds, stand ready to buy those bonds if necessary, the mere announcement moved those assets to higher valuations and lower estimates of risk. So what happens after the Fed acts? That's the transmission that we were talking about, the transmission mechanism. The traditional view that has prevailed for so many years is that what happens when the Fed acts, uh, acts is that the one interest rate that the Fed has the most influence over, the federal funds rate, changes. That's the overnight rate charged among banks. And you know that banks frequently have money that um, they're going to need tomorrow, but they don't need it tonight, so they lend it overnight. Or a bank is a little short coming to the end of the day and wants to borrow. So the banks have this federal funds market and the Federal Reserve actively intervenes in that market and essentially sets within a band the federal funds rate. And now other interest rates fall in line. So that is the traditional transmission mechanism that the Federal Reserve would lower the federal funds rate and now other interest rates would fall in line. And that's always true. Other interest rates fall in line until they don't. <laughs> That's right, until they don't. Because since the Fed can only directly affect that one rate, it's possible that the transmission mechanism will slip. Markets don't always behave as predicted. That long treasury market always has an eye on inflation in addition to other things that are uh, influenced by the Fed, and it can sometimes move in an opposite direction out there to the federal funds rate. So the federal funds rate intervention has the most effect on short-term interest rates, since those are highly substitutable, and the least effect on those long rates like the 30-year treasury or mortgage rates. That's our traditional view. So it is possible that the Fed would try to loosen and mortgage rates wouldn't follow. That is actually one manifestation of what's been called pushing on a string. We all know we can get some action when we pull on a string. And when the Federal Reserve tightens, yeah, it can get some action. It can slow the economy down. But when it's trying to loosen and have an effect in mortgages, sometimes it might be like pushing on a string and nothing happens. But now, things have changed. Since the Fed can buy any financial asset, it can directly intervene. Before, the junk bond rate was considered beyond the Federal Reserve's control. It could push and pull on the federal funds rate, but the junk bond rate would be moved by the imperatives of that market. That's what people thought. But now, the Fed could affect both risk and return by direct purchases. One of my favorite economists, the grumpy economist, go find him, just search grumpy economist and you'll find him, John Cochran. He expressed uh, some alarm on his blog uh, when he saw what the Fed had done. He was wondering, is the Fed sort of like guaranteeing everybody who holds fixed income securities? And if you're a fixed income security holder, well, that's fine. The Fed has your back. But is that a good thing for the economy in the long run? If rates mostly do fall in line, if they do, then we're back to the traditional transmission mechanism. All interest sensitive assets become more valuable. There's that term, interest sensitive assets. 
And those are obviously assets that respond to the rate of interest. Assets related to autos and housing. When interest rates go down, it's great news for the car dealership, great news for the home builders and real estate agents. Assets related to autos and housing. Not so much grocery chains or convenience stores. People don't consult interest rates before they go buy a Slurpee in the same way that they consult interest rates before they think about getting a new car or you know, buying a house. So if interest rates mostly do fall in line, we get this transmission mechanism. So here's a Fed watching scenario for you. You follow the Fed news, new, you predict the markets the Fed will touch. From the first draft of this presentation, this is a new bullet point because you never had to predict that before. The Federal Reserve was going to be in securities markets, mostly short term, and maybe it would occasionally foray a little bit outside that. But what the Fed has announced in recent weeks is far beyond what it used to do. Then you predict whether they're tighten or loosen more than the market expects. Those italicized words are very important there because the market is always expecting a certain amount of tightening or loosening and it has already built that into asset prices and returns. So you don't get your free pass just by being a Fed watcher. You also have to be a market watcher to predict whether they'll tighten or loosen more than the market expects. Then you predict how the economy will react. And that's another big unknown because the transmission mechanism as hard as it is to figure when there are only short-term securities on the front end of it, it has just in the past two or three weeks gotten even harder. How will the economy react to these new transmission mechanisms? So then you adjust your portfolio accordingly and then potentially enjoy higher returns when the Fed does as you predicted. See how tenuous that chain is? You've got to do all that. You've got to do all that, you've got to do all that, and then potentially enjoy the higher returns when the Fed does as you predicted. And if you predicted wrong, you may lose. So there's your Fed watching scenario. So it's a good time to ask yourself, where is your investor's advantage? Is it in smaller, less actively traded areas? Is there some part of the market that is not followed by so many analysts, uh, maybe a little bit less liquid, a place where you have the ability to follow it. <clears throat> Is your investor's advantage in sectors you knew well, you know well, perhaps because of a recent retirement from an area or uh, consulting work that you do in a particular area? Not that we're talking about any kind of uh, inside information, just the information about a sector that you know really well. Is your investor's advantage in your ability to ride out temporary fluctuations, knowing the historical trends in asset markets? Is that your investor's advantage? Or is it in guessing more accurately than the Fed watchers about what the Fed will do next? Well, you can see that I have loaded this question and it was given away in the title of my presentation. This is why you don't wanna be a Fed watcher and have that to, uh, to drive your investment strategy. Why instead, you probably just want to join the rest of us in being amateur Fed watchers. Hey, I've got two free wild cards for you. A little bit off topic, but they are free. International stocks and the Fed. Look at this chart. International stocks have been underperforming U.S. stocks for a long time. I sit on the board of a nonprofit on the finance committee locally, and we have two fund managers that work with us, and we have our funds divided between the two. One of the fund managers is rather conservative and always comes in and says, you know, we're going to try to beat the market a little bit, but we're not going to beat the market by much. That's just who we are. You know, we're relatively conservative fund managers. The other fund managers came in, and at our annual meeting, they said, we have a play that we think promises the potential of good return without a lot of risk. 
and they couched their language very carefully, like that opening slide of disclosures. But their point was that the gap between international and U.S. stocks when they spoke was wide, 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 and they did not think that gap could persist. And they thought that the gap would be eliminated one way or another, either by lower returns on U.S. stocks or higher returns on international stocks. And so they recommended that this nonprofit organization with the funds entrusted to their management overweight international stocks. So as a board, I think we did the responsible thing. We asked for more information. This investment manager actually had a minority part of our portfolio. So we left the other more conservatively invested stuff where it was and said, okay, you know, we think your strategy looks sound. The conjecture they had was, keep in mind, this is in the month of January, that gap will close unless interest rates go up sharply in the U.S. or a worldwide event messes everything up. Now, they didn't say it in those terms, but guess what? A worldwide event messed everything up. There is the possibility that this whole COVID-19 thing prevents those asset prices from resolving in the way that they had in mind. So anyway, that's a wild card for you. International stocks and the Fed. Um, a possibility of overweighting international stocks, but a possibility that depends on some things that have already gone wrong negative interest rates that is a possibility did you see the news the british government just put out some funds at negative interest rates let's think about what that means your bank certificate of deposit that's a ten thousand dollar cd paying an interest rate of negative one percent let me make sure i did the math right here i stuck a yellow sticky note on this it said give us ten thousand dollars and a year later we'll return 9,900. That doesn't sound very good, does it? I mean, to your average certificate of deposit holder, doesn't sound good at all. I addressed a regional panel for the Virginia Bankers Association back in the fall. And I talked to them about the possibility of negative interest rates because one of my colleagues who is very well connected internationally said, negative interest rates are on the way, they're already in Europe, and they're headed here. So I asked those bankers, I said, look, you've got out here in Virginia, a number of customers, depositors that would prefer not to get a negative interest rate. Will those depositors go just withdraw cash and stick it in their safe deposit boxes? And a whole bunch of heads were shaking. No, 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 they wouldn't do that. Uh, somebody pointed out that you're not supposed to do that. There's some you know, law or regulation or something that says you can't just hold cash in your safe deposit box. At the break, a banker from rural Farmville, Appomattox, Virginia, came up and said, you bet they'd do it. I've got customers that would do it. And, and I asked him, well, that's not right, is it? You're not supposed to do that? And what he told me was, right you are not supposed to do it but there is this other tradition that is very strong in banking that we don't inquire into what's in safe deposit boxes so he left that ambiguity there i think he had people that probably would follow that strategy how much debt is negative i call this a current estimate but since i made this estimate based on publicly available sources it's gotten more at the time i made the estimate about a third of government debt worldwide was carrying negative interest rates, and it's more now, including some very recent British debt. You pay the bank to give you back less than you paid in. Will these rates come to the U.S.? Only the Fed watchers know, and they don't really know. Once over lightly, the Fed watchers predict future monetary policy. They can make millions in minutes. It all depends on links to the real economy, and it is hard to beat them at their game. They've got the inside track on what the Fed is going to do. Not inside in the terms of breaking any securities laws, 
but just having insights that I think active retail investors out here in the hinterland just probably don't have. Conjecture, are international stocks going to do better? How about now? And my conjecture, negative interest rates could be a very big deal. Questions, we'll open it up to questions here. I'll turn it back over to our moderator. If you wanna see these slides, send me an email at my James Madison University email address. James Madison University proudly expecting to welcome our new freshman class on August the 22nd with classes beginning August 26th. And we're gonna move heaven and earth to make it happen, we hope. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. There was a lot of uh, interest. Um, not too many questions thus far. If anyone does have questions, please post them. Uh, one uh, comment was uh, he wonder, um, uh, uh, Ahmed wonders if it's FOMC for Federal Onion Meeting Committee. <laughs> that's, a great, uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice comment. Uh, few others. Uh, that's a great presentation. Thank you. Um, that's uh, it for questions. Let me see if there were any earlier. Um, someone did ask, and I did post, if this um, great presentation was being recorded. Uh, yes, it's recorded, and it will be on our website, uh, typically within two to three business days. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, so uh, if any, any questions, uh, please post them. If not, Bill, um, any any further comments? Um, no. Um, I, well, I will mention one thing. Um, I love doing this, and a, a co-author and I just got a scholarly paper on Dave Ramsey accepted, and I so wish that I could share the content. I'd be putting it out right there, but intellectual property says I can't. Uh, a lot of your customers are probably familiar with Dave Ramsey. The conclusion is, if you've got a negative net worth, Dave's the guy. If you've got a positive net worth, there are probably better strategies, but we have an academic approach to the whole thing, forthcoming in the Journal of Economics and Finance Education. All right, great. Um, a few questions that did come through. Um, someone asks, Ahmad Ahmed asks if you have any online courses on economics at JMU, any postgraduate course. Um, and then there's another question about uh, would negative interest rates apply to regular consumer bank accounts like checking and savings accounts? Yeah, let's take those two. First of all, at James Madison University, we don't have many offerings that non-students uh, can take. We do have an online MBA in information security and a partly online MBA. We don't have graduate economics online and we're primarily an undergraduate institution. I wish I had something more for you on that. Um, will negative interest rates come to consumer accounts? I think the banks will try just as hard as they can to avoid that. I think it will be done mainly through higher fees. You'll have uh, less free checking. You'll have uh, less you know, free checks, premiums, those kinds of things. The banking community, as I saw at that Virginia bankers meeting, they just hate the idea of having to explain negative interest rates to customers. And they're gonna fight it with everything, every marketing tool, every pricing strategy they've got. All right, great. I mean, that that is a good question because uh, I think a lot of people, you know, see things like that happening over in Europe, um, and uh, you know, having that come to the United States, that would drastically change uh, change our, our our finances. I would say. Yeah. Um, and an, another. Go ahead. Another question came in though. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you get to a minus half percent or a minus one percent. Um, that's not huge, but the emotional impact would be what I'd worry about. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Um, another question, uh, maybe a couple questions coming in. Uh, with negative interest rates, wouldn't the depositors immediately withdraw their funds? Why would they still keep the money in there to suffer the penalty? The short answer is that they don't have any good place to keep it. Um, is there a good place to keep cash so that it just earns 0%? 
And that's what those customers of that Farmville Appomattox Bank were going to do. They were going to put it in cash in their safe deposit boxes. That is a possibility. It's supposedly against law and regulation to do it, but I don't know. It looked like a gray area to me. All right, great. Uh, another question comes in. Uh, creating money out of nothing is one of the outcomes of MMT or Keynes economic theory. Peter Schiff is a big critic of Keynes. Which school of thought would you do you subscribe? I'm eclectic. <laughs> I think everybody's got something to bring to the party. Um, in that, I think there are some great insights from the new Keynesian school which points out that market imperfections and rigidities can create a role for fiscal policy. I'm a monetarist sometime. I studied under Leland Yeager, who's a great monetarist. What a privilege it was to study under Dr. Yeager. Um, and whenever I was in his class, I was just totally convinced that monetarist answers were right. But for those answers to be right, the stability of money, the, the, the money demand function needed to be relatively stable, the velocity of money needed to be relatively stable, and we have seen the velocity of money, the rate at which it's spent, just go through the seller floor. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the one thing I do know is that the policy that our federal government has been following for a number of years is not really recommended by Keynesians, New Keynesians, Old Keynesians, monetarists, the public choice school, and that is the policy of running up entitlement obligations, um, seemingly without limit. Uh, so that is one of those things where there's not a good argument for it from conventional uh, economists and the government keeps doing it. The people that believe in MMT have a very favorable view of the amount of debt you can issue and the amount of money that you can print um, without adverse consequences. And I hope they're right. <laughs> I'm afraid they're not. All right, great. Um, a few more questions coming in uh, across multiple different, uh, different people. Um, is buying hard assets such as gold and silver a good hedge for negative rates? Ah, uh, now that is a tough question. It is a great hedge against inflation because precious metal hard assets, they do great when the price level overall is going up. It's really hard to say what negative interest rates will do to that. Um, it is possible that to get us out of our negative interest rates, the Fed would inflate and in that circumstance, hard assets would look really good. Um, I'll just tell you about my own portfolio. I don't have any hard assets in there. I do have some assets that are sensitive to hard assets, but there's no actual precious metal in there. Um, the trouble with hard assets is they don't pay a return, but hey, if money starts paying a negative return, not paying a return looks okay. And of course, the return is so variable because it depends only on capital gains and they go all over the place. All right, fantastic. Um, one last question. Uh, I, I would assume that you covered this in the presentation, but um, uh, a, a good question, for especially for people that are just uh, you know getting started. Um, does the magic checking account have anything to do with the printing of money? Um, it does. And the um, way that this works is that the quantity of money that affects the economy is the total checking deposits, checkable deposits, anything you can write a check on, plus the currency. That total is what counts and not how it's divided between deposits and actual paper currency. And so when the Federal Reserve creates money that money is money, and it really doesn't matter how much of it goes into uh, paper money versus all the other things that can happen with it. And that is because between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, we have a passive policy on currency, which means we provide enough printed currency to meet whatever people want to have. Anytime they go to the bank and want cash, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury working together um, mostly the Federal Reserve are going to make sure that it happens. Uh, back after 9-11, uh, 
the Fed pumped a bunch of liquidity into the economy. I had students working at the Federal Reserve that very day. They were there on the ground uh, in real time. The Federal Reserve did not want people to go to the ATM and there'd be no money there. And so they wanted the banks adequately provisioned with liquidity so that they could order up the currency any way that they wanted. So the short answer to the question is that when the Fed creates electronic money, that money is created, it is money, and it's a matter of indifference economically how much of it is paper versus other things. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I think that will um, end it for us tonight. A few other people posted great presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, of course, one really good, another good question comes in. Yeah, got time for one more? Let's do one more. All right, guys, this is the last question. Um, is there any accountability on GDP versus money in circulation? Yeah. Um, the government works very hard to keep both of those things. And when you have both of those things, you can uh, calculate the velocity of money. So I trust the people at the government that are collecting those statistics. But that doesn't mean I think those statistics are accurate because there are conceptual defects in every measure of money and every measure of the GDP. Just to give you one example, to really get a good measure of the GDP, you've got to know the prices at, thing, at which things sell. Well, if they're out of stock, that price is meaningless. And there are, here and there in our economy, things that are out of stock or that you have to spend a whole lot more time and effort to get, like putting on your mask or waiting in line at Costco and doing things like that. So I think our money and GDP statistics are less reliable right now, and that at a time when we would really prefer that they be more reliable. All right, great, Bill. Thanks. That was, that was a you know kind of a I would say a tough question, good question, very good answer. I, I uh, think that a lot of people will uh, benefit from that. Um, a few more people uh, posted great presentation. Thank you. Um, and uh, you know I, I want to thank you. Lightspeed wants to thank you for taking your time to present to us today. Uh, it's all, as always. You know, very good information and uh, presented in a, a very easy to understand uh, uh, method. I, it's it's really really nice to see. It's a, kind of a change for us. You know, we're we're into the active trading of stocks, options, and futures, um, but uh, definitely good to hear from uh, you know a different viewpoint. Um, with that said, uh, we're going to end the presentation for the evening. Uh, again, Bill, thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I hope you learned something that will benefit you in the future, whether it's with your trading or, or other investments. And uh, I guess we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Go Dukes. <laughs> Very good. Thank you all. Have a good evening.